thank all y'all for coming. Um, it is weird not to be in person. I can't wait till we can do this, but thank you for coming virtually. And thank you those of you that are at the Southwest Regional Library. And just so you know that the gardens there are attended by the North Central Chapter um, demonstration, demonstration Garden Team. And um, Teresa Thomas leads that along with, oh gosh, I just um, forgot her name, sorry. Maybe Josephine can put it in the chat. Anyway, screenshots are fine for most of this program. There'll be a small time when I'll ask you not to, but um, that'll be just for a bit. And everyone that's registered will get the resource pages as Lynn just told you. I am the past president of the State Society, uh, immediate past president. I've served for four years now on the executive board and I have two more years to go as immediate past president. It's a volunteer position as are all of our state officers. Our mission, not only do we promote uh, conservation, research, and utilization of native plants and plant habitats of Texas, but we try to do that through our education, outreach, and example. Here is our founder, Carol Abbott, who, who uh, helped found our society in 1981. Today, again, I hope to give you valuable gardening knowledge. We'll talk about invasive plants, how to get rid of them, uh, what to plant instead, and then something, a homegrown national park, which is a new idea that's uh, gaining uh, traction and something I signed up for last night. So we'll dive right in and talk about what are invasive plants. Well, it has to have at least three, these three things to be invasive. Non-native, and has the potential it either is or is having the potential to cause economic damage or environmental damage. And usually it's both. The, I don't expect you to read this position statement. It is on your resource documents, but I just wanted to put it here to let you know that the Native Plant Society has a statement on invasive plants, but some definitions that can be interesting and sometimes problematic. You need to kind of be aware of today as we go through what is an invasive plant. First of all, what is a native plant? We talked about that in depth last week, but it occurs naturally in an ecoregion or environment with generally no human intervention. Um, prior to European uh, arrival here in this on this continent, uh, Native Americans moved plants around, but we don't have a record of what they did. So anyway, non-native, of course, does not occur naturally in a particular ecoregion or environment. And then, as I said just a while ago, the invasive is non-native and it can hurt um, and cause economic environmental harm or harm to human health. So quick review, why, do I, why did I give you those definitions? Because ecoregions and environments is really important in the definition of what is native and what is non-native. We are of course here in Tarrant County in the Cross Timbers and Prairies ecoregion. And um, those ecoregions have evolved through the living, the biotic and the non-living, the abiotic things that have co-evolved over millions of years to create these food webs where everything is independent, sorry, dependent on each other. But we do have some invasive plants that have moved into Texas. Uh, I'm not sure of the source of this. I grabbed it off the internet. Uh, it is talking about honeysuckle and Johnson grass and Mandina and Chinaberry, and then there's just the gray circle for other things. So today we'll talk about all of these except for the Johnson grass. But what we want to do is protect what we love. And we love Texas. We're all, I'm sure, very proud Texans. I am. I've uh, been here since I was 10 years old. So I love Texas. It's a big state, it has a lot of ecoregions, and it has a lot of good things going for it. We wanna keep that going. And our vitality and our sense of place uh, tells us you can, you know, put a blindfold on and drop most Native Plant Society of Texas people anywhere in the state, and they can look around and tell you where they are by looking at the plants they have. But if you'll notice something on this map, where are the, invasive plants clustering where, where there are people. So we have a lot to do with invasive plants. 
here's a whole map of the world. Normally, when we talk about invasive plants, we are thinking about things that come from other continents or maybe from the other, uh, the, we have invasive plants in our state actually from California. You know, there's a big mountain range between us and California. But from our definition, a plant that's from the Edwards Plateau and only occurs there would be a non-native plant to our ecoregion here in the cross chambers and prairies. But that ship sailed a long time ago, say with Greg Salvia. That plant has been in the nursery trade for over a hundred years. So there's always gray. We have some gray areas. So if you're looking at a non-native plant that's maybe a hundred miles away that we know our animals or insects and what have you can adapt to them versus something that's from 6,000 miles away for something from the other side of the world or something from the Southern hemisphere, it, it's a big difference. So again, we're gonna look gray here, but for the most part, when we're talking about non-native plants, we are talking about things that are from a very far away. Uh, I hope most of y'all are from Texas. Uh, I'm sorry, are from North Central Texas. Some of you may not be. And if you're, if you're coming to see this uh, program from away, thank you very much for coming. But thank all y'all for coming. Anyway, what do these things have in common? Uh, there is a forest around the zoo. There's the uh, forest um, hill, forest park pool, sorry. Uh, there's lots of things there. And you look around the forest and you may notice something particular about that forest. The Fort Worth Nature Center areas, there are some areas that have something in common. Tandy Hills Natural Area, Cleburne State Park, Pembroke Lake on the East Shore. What do all these things have in common besides being very wonderful areas to get out in nature and enjoy life? They have privet. Usually I think it's Chinese privet, but they're all, all kinds of privet, but they have privet in common and it's going to cost a lot of money to remove it. The Fort Worth Nature Center has been working on it for quite some time, as anyone that has uh, volunteered there can attest. These two pictures are taken on the trail on the eastern side of Lake Benbrook. It's a horse trail and a hunter trail and a walker's trail. And I suspect that this privet came from the retirement community that is there, is there, gosh, I forgot the name of it. I just had it, I've known that forever. Oh, well, anyway, uh, I'm sure the people that moved there didn't think about it, didn't, didn't wanna hurt the environment, loved the environment, and they didn't think they were doing anything wrong or hurting it by planting privet. But that has happened and it will cost a lot of money to restore that habitat. It's estimated that invasive plants cost in excess of, has cost us in excess of $120 billion. Now that is a quote from the same article that I got this graph from, and it is referenced, it's from a Clemson University. And there is something called an invasion of lag. For the most part, it's a long slog of having a plant around that could become invasive before it becomes invasive, uh, maybe even up to a hundred years. So if you look at the Chinese privet graph here, around 80 years ago, when they planted two plants at the Cleburne uh, State Park, they didn't know that this would happen. And when you go there today, the understory in many areas of the park is covered in privet. So it's forming a monoculture. It's happening, what that does then is um, it's formed a thicket colonizing under there and it limits the amount of food that is supposed to have for this wonderful rich ecosystem that should have evolved there and been, been there to provide food and shelter for four seasons. So an invasion of lag is something to keep in mind as you go to stores and they say, oh, that's not a problem, it's not invasive, doesn't mean it won't become. If it can form a thicket and colonize, if it has seeds that disperse on wind or water, if it can be eaten and transported by animals, it has the potential to become an invasive plant. 
and we talked about this last week with our native plants, they give us a sense of place. This um, annual has become a problem in the last 10 years, I think. It's, um, I call it messy mustard from the Mediterranean. Some people call it the illegitimate cabbage. Uh, and it is, it is getting all over our roadsides. It is an annual. If we pull it before it seeds then, and make sure that uh, we're not spreading seeds as we pull it, that we're disposing of it properly, then that's a great way to get rid of it, pull it. I know that Jo Collins, many of you know her, have done this with the, she has the um, uh, Cabbage Bash uh, with students. Now before, before COVID, it was every year. I think she's gonna do another one this year. I hope she is. And they have made a difference in pulling these weeds out, invasive plants on the side of the Trinity River in Fort Worth. So thank them. But you know, I had a friend that said, I showed her a picture of this and she said, oh my goodness, I thought that was native. It's everywhere, I just loved it. Until I told her about that it was displacing our native plants. And how sad because we have beautiful, beautiful roadsides. So invasive plants can cause environmental damage. They'll make monoculture. We won't have our biodiversity. They break the food chain. They create food deserts for our animals, and they're really hurting our insect populations, which if you're paying attention, which I hope you are, you're here, you probably are, you know that our insect populations are suffering, which means our pollinators are suffering, which means our food crops can suffer because we are part of this whole vast system. So, that's what a native plant can, it, not everything about it, but enough to get you started. So how can we get rid of those pesky invasive plants? Well, it's not easy. You can dig it out, pull it out, or cut it out. You could burn it out. You can do a lot of things to get rid of them, but it's all a lot of work. Unless uh, one of my friends recently told me that she lives near the Fort Worth Nature Center in the Western Cross Timbers, and she has to go through in the spring and crawl around in her forest that she has and pull out all the privet. And she said she gets about a hundred privets, oh, maybe about this, this big. So between the top and the roots, so they're easy to pull, but that's like one of her spring activities. Gotta go through the privet pull before those roots go down too deep. You can also use herbicides. If you're going to use herbicides, please, please, please be very careful. Don't get it on your skin, don't inhale it, don't overspray it onto other, other things. Um, herbicides have a potential to hurt people and other plants. So you wanna just keep it on the target plant. Some people I've read will take the bingo, you know how the bingo, you're going real fast and bingo with the game you play and you hit all the little squares with the little dauber thing and has a sponge on the end of it. You could put a herbicide in there, maybe uh, something that's similar to Roundup or maybe poison ivy, a woody, woody killer. The poison ivy killer is good also to use for these things. In the cut and daub or cut and drip, some people put it in little soap things and they drip it on to just on the cut. So cut and daub or cut and spray. If you're gonna spray, get yourself a thick piece of paper or cardboard or something that you can wrap around that plant so when you spray you're only hitting the cut and get those cuts pretty fast so you're going to cut and cut and daub or spray and you're going to do it within 30 seconds to not longer than two minutes after cutting it that might even be too long most plants are starting to heal those wounds so it's hard work to get rid of um, non-native plants but it can be done but you know the best thing to do is to never plant them now, if you have a new home, like Lynn said she had earlier, she may unfortunately have some invasives or non-natives that she's not interested in having there, and they may be difficult to remove, but she can do it. But what's the best thing to do? Plant natives so that our animals will have food, shelter, and water for four seasons, and you can find a place uh, to enjoy at the outdoors. Watch what comes by, listen to the birds sing. 
That's what native plants can do for us, restore our, restore our um, happiness and spirit. So what to plant instead? And now I have to do a disclaimer because by law from the, um, uh, I guess the Texas Agricultural Department got this instituted in 2011 or someone did, we have to require a disclaimer. This one I will read to you. This plant list is only a recommendation and has no legal effect in the state of Texas. It is, law, it is lawful to sell, distribute, import, or possess a plant on this list unless the Texas Department of Agriculture labels the plant as noxious or invasive on the department's plant list. Okay, so I am required to do that by law and I have done so because I am talking to you longer than 15 minutes about this list. This might be longer than 15 minutes. Here is the Texas Department of Agriculture's list, official plant list, and you have it in your handouts. There are about 30 or 31 on here. One of the, one of the plants is repeated. Um, there is one that really jumps up to my eye, purple loose strip, years ago that was sold in, in um, nurseries as a highly adapted non-native plant. Oh my goodness. And now here it's sitting on this official list. Well, it takes a lot of work to get a plant on the official list. And a lot of these are water plants. Uh, we do see some trees pop out. Uh, the Chinese tallow tree you might have that in your yard. It, it's noxious and invasive according to the state of Texas, which is a big deal. Also, uh, kudzu, I don't think we have that much as a problem here, but we know other states have a horrible problem with it. So we will look at some of these plants, um, but not many, because we're gonna look at more that are on this list. This is a non-official, and so I have the disclaimer at the bottom of the screen there that I did read to you from the texasinvasive.org. So you have a link to that. And when you get your PDF on your computer, it'll be an active link. So look at this list. There is about 200 plants on the list. I, I actually didn't count them all. I just estimated the count, but um, there's quite a few and we'll go through them and you can um, go through it methodically if you want to, or here and there, and learn your way through what texasinvasive.org says are invasive. And as these become more prominent, our native plants are being displaced. These are the ones that are really particularly annoyingsome for me. Uh, the privet, because I like to walk in all those places that were mentioned earlier, and it, ma it makes my, my heart sad to see the privet. Uh, I know that the people that run these places are working very hard to eradicate them. And so we need uh, more volunteer effort to do that. And we need a governmental effort, I think, or citywide effort. Uh, maybe we need a CCC effort, you know, like the Civilian Conservation Corps in the early 1900s to get rid of these things. I see Nandina at Tandy Hills. Um, gosh, um, 20 years ago, 15, maybe, maybe it was more like 17 years ago, I was talked into some in my yard. I am still fighting it today, but I will win this battle. The Bradford pears are a huge problem. And I think out of the neighbors directly around me, I have a small neighborhood of about 40, 40 houses. I would say at least half of them have Bradford pears. Ooh. And the Chinese pistache, there's two, there are quarter mile away from me. Last year, I pulled out 30, you know, so from and I confused them. I thought, oh my gosh, flame leaf sumac. I can't believe But when they got a little bit bigger, I looked at the leaf structure and I looked at the bark and I looked at how fast they were growing. And I thought that is not flame leaf sumac. And it was a Chinese pistache. So my goodness. And of course, KR blue stem, if you have any property, um, at all, or you, it's everywhere. Oh my gosh, it grows and cracks. I, that stuff's crazy. So those are the ones I really can't stand. Uh, red tip petunia, Chinese petunia, Taiwanese petunia. This is uh, an invasive plant that is, I've heard recently on Texas flora, spreading all over the hill country. It is on the Texas invasive database, um, but it's also for sale. So you can still buy it. It 
I would like to see this be on our invasive and noxious weed list officially so that we could quit selling it. And I realize that that can be problematic if you've invested, if you're a grower and you've invested a lot in this, you know, we, uh, that's understandable. And I wouldn't want to hurt anyone's livelihood, but we have to make tough choices in life. And I choose nature. So um, perhaps you, we could say as a compassionate people, you could um, in two years, you know, you better start growing some native plants that will take this place because in two years, you won't be able to sell us anymore or something like that. I don't know, it'd be lovely if that could happen. And, oh, there it is. <laughs> Look at the bottom. I got, I got the uh, highly adapted non-natives. When you see that, don't buy it. Goodness sakes, that's gonna be the next invasive plant. And that just, that even just hurts my eyes to look at that. Gosh, be wary of that label. I can, now I gotta try to get my, there we go. Look at all these different native plants. It makes, uh, it makes Carol Abbott really happy there to think about the, the native plants that could take the place of that. Uh, elbow bush we talked about last week and possum haw, uh, fragrant sumac we talked about last week. But I think most of y'all are familiar with Yopon holly. Uh, if not, uh, you know you can look it up on the Lady Bird Johnson database. But I want to explore a couple of these today, the wax myrtle and the evergreen sumac. Uh, the southern wax myrtle is a beautiful plant. There is a dwarf variety as well, uh, but they can get really large. Uh, depending on how you prune them, they'll have a different look and they smell great. You just rub those leaves together. Oh my goodness. And you can bring them in. Maybe you could make a little thing for your head. I don't know. They're wonderful. A beautiful native plant that will go great in our region. And of course the possum paw holly, uh, this is a picture I took out at the Bimbrook Prairie in an environmentally sensitive area. And we, I, I love this plant, so I have to talk about it again. And then here you can see, here it is uh, pruned up. So whoever uh, owned this one in the lower right has pruned that up to make it uh, look more umbrella-like and just taken down off the lower, the lower um, stems. And there's the beautiful fruit. It's deciduous plant, so it's going to lose the leaves for winter and it can grow 15 to 30 feet. Keep it away from your house, right? because you know you're, you were here last week. Hopefully, if not, watch the video. Um, you need to know the adult size of these plants when you're putting them in your landscaping. Here's a Bradford pear that 25 years ago probably didn't cost very much and my neighbors all thought that they were really great, but um, I think they were sold the bill of goods because if you can see here, <laughs> they have a rotting fish smell sometimes in spring and summer from the blooms. So why would you plant that? I don't know, but you can buy them for $119 if you want. And it says fast growing, so that's always worrying. Some, the faster it grows, the weaker the wood. And their branching pattern is very weak. I meant to get a picture of my poor neighbors here. These are the second owners. They didn't plant the plant, but a big, huge limb fell off recently and it almost hit their roof. And I mean, it was a big limb. So the way the growth habit of that tree um, is not a healthy one and it's weak, it's a weak tree. So um, it can form uh, the calorie pear, the calorie plant is where it comes from and they can form thickets and displace native plants. And <laughs> there's a lot of other states that have really, really put their foot down about the Bradford pear. There was a bounty for a while on them in South Carolina. You had to sign up for it early. They're banned in Pennsylvania. And it doesn't take a very long search on Google to see that in Indiana, Maryland, Ohio, Kansas, other states, lots of other states, they'll say Bradford pear is a bad thing. I couldn't find one about Texas. If you can, let me know. We need to, um, we need to be smarter about this. Uh, this is an up and coming problem, problematic plant. Uh, I can't see it really uh, being invasive by fruits, but I think that it's kind of kudzui in a way, very aggressive. I mean, the, some of the top questions are, how can I get rid of it? 
Why is it so aggressive and how can I get rid of it? Because it's also a really nice place, I think, for rodents to hide. So uh, I would not recommend this plant. It's uh, peeps. And now we're moving into the, the, the 40, I'm gonna go through 14 invasive plants. And in that process, I'll go through 40 native alternatives. So we'll get started. And I wanna thank Dee Dee Wright from the NPSOT Kerbal chapter for being so gracious to provide these for me. So these are the one of, uh, slides I'm gonna ask you not to take screenshots of if you're do doing that because they are Dee Dee's slides and um, you'll have to get her permission. So China Berry, uh, it's here. It's in, in North Texas and it's an invasive plant. So I gotta get my notes to make sure I tell you everything I wanted to about it. It can raise the nitrogen level of soil, so it can change the soil profile. It has chemicals in its leaves for insects, and it can crowd out native plants. And it says in this little crib sheet that the berries are poisonous to dog, cats, and horses. So, ooh, native alternatives. A uh, red oak is always a good choice, especially for um, suburban yards. Don't plant it too close to your house. Western soapberry. Goodness, it looks almost exactly the same, except the, the seed pods uh, with the fleshy fruit around them will be translucent. So you'll be able to see through it and see the seed inside of that little uh, seed, the little fruit. So the China berry, that's a really great way to tell if it has fruit on it. The China berry will be opaque. You will not be able to see the seed, but our soap berry, you can. Uh, Chinka pin oak is also a nice native alternative. We talked about that last week. The golden rain tree. I remember walking around the campus at Texas Women's University when I took a course there in the early 1980s and they had some of these there. They, they were uh, proud of it. Um, I don't, I doubt if they still have them, I hope not, but they're here in North Texas and um, they can be allopathic, meaning that the roots can kill surrounding plants and they can form colonies. And they have these seed pods here, are, um, I guess can be spread by animals and wind. But wouldn't you rather have a Texas red bud or a smoke tree? Now we talked about these last week as well. The one, the red bud that's good for our, our area is the Texensis. And if it's happy, it can get up to 30 feet. And the smoke tree, if it's happy, can grow 20, 25 feet. And, um, you would want to, along the way, be sure to prune these nicely according to a good pruning directions as they grow. But uh, I love, I, we have these on our property and I love both of these plants. The white mulberry. Oh, flashback to another story when I was in college in Denton. I lived in a two story, really old apartment building. And I was at the middle of the second story and right in front of me was a mulberry tree. So I could just pick the little berries off. I love that memory, but I have no idea now if that was an invasive mulberry or a native mulberry. But um, the white mulberry that is non-native uh, can colonize areas, of course, and form thickets, uh, a type of thickets. This is displacing the native plants. And it can also hybridize with our native plants. And so that's a particular problem when we start getting hybrids. And there's another plant on our list that will do that. So it's problematic. The um, fruit, it says, is not edible from the white mulberry. So why would you plant that? You wanna eat the fruit. You know, I guess maybe the one that I had in Denton was, was not this because I ate the berries. I didn't have any problem from it. Um, the white mulberry has a very deep tap root. Most plants, trees do not have a tap root. They have roots that kind of go out like this, but this one has a, a tap root, so it'll be hard to kill. Native replacements. So the red mulberry, of course, it's a, it's a little bit smaller tree, uh, but I'm sorry, it's similar in size and it can attract birds and we can eat the berries. So yay, that's wonderful. Uh, and one way you can tell the difference between the white mulberry and the Texas red mulberry is that the mulberry, white mulberry leaves, the non-native, will have glossy surfaces where the native will not be so glossy. So, um, and there are botany terms for that, but anyway, the hackberry is a, 
a predominant tree in our area. You'll find it all of our native areas. It's a wonderful tree. It gets a lot of bad press because it might be spreading around your yard, but that's what life wants to do. You'll have to keep it under control, but the birds eat it and the caterpillars eat it too. So in the spring, uh, you know, there's 20 different kinds of caterpillars that like this tree. So it's feeding the baby birds in spring. Now, also, if you look on the right there, those are a monarch butterflies that were in my garden. And um, ever since I, I've always had monarchs come through since I've been native gardening, but I put some frost weed in, which is a um, native to our region. And it's an understory, can grow in shade or, or part sun. And now I have tons of monarchs come through and they have always liked to roost in the hackberries in my yard. So they spend the night here and I'll have two and 300 monarchs sleeping away in my hackberries. So I don't, they don't, they choose to do that rather than the bur oaks or, you know, other things that we have around. I don't know why. Invasive vitex, also called chase tree, also called, can you believe it, Texas lilac. They're telling you a story. It's been here for a long time, and that invasion of lag is going like this whew, on the upswing, especially in riparian areas. Um, I remember years ago seeing a lot of it around Dinosaur Valley, you know, around that little bend there. I'll have to go back, <clears throat> excuse me, in the spring and see if it's still there. That was before I knew what it was and enough to make it break my heart to see it there. But um, this is sold a lot in Texas. And if you have one, it might break your heart to take it out, but you can find alternatives for it. All right. Oh, and look, I have this, look, I made a link here. I looked at the clock. I'm gonna have to start talking faster. Uh, the buckeye, the red buckeye is more of an East Texas plant. The uh, um, Anachaca orchid is more of a West Texas plant, although I have one growing in my yard. I have a lot of desert willows. If I had to do it over, I would mainly focus on plants from my eco region, but they've been there for 20 years. And I have too many of them. I would have planted more of our, our eco region plants. The Mexican buckeye will grow great here, but let's just take a quick look at, so here we went to the Ladybird Johnson Wildflower Center. And this is what you need to learn. You need to go through and read about these plants. I put links in that handout. And you can look through and see all these different things about it and the growing conditions and the benefits and how you might want to propagate it. And I know people in the audience, Josephine probably goes through a lot because she's got a green thumb and propagates a lot. But it says that it needs a medium to high water use. So, you know, you've got to read about these plants before you, um, before you plant them. And where is my... I hope I'm still, okay, it looks like I'm still zooming, but where is my, oh no, have I lost my program? Nope, here we are, we're back. Privet, oh, goodness, it's, it's large and alive. Look at that privet, it's everywhere, right? So we don't want privet or ligustrum. So this is the large leaf privet and the pollen that can uh, make allergies worth worse and can give people asthma. It's extremely fast growing. It shades out other plants, colonizes by root sprouts. So look, um, things that can take its place. Oh wait, here we go. Here's Lisa's Ligustrum. My friend Lisa, if you were here last week, she's the one that won the award in Wedgwood. She, she cut out a Ligustrum. She learned it was non-native and problematic. And so she cut it out and oh my goodness, cut it down. Look at all these little things that's coming up this spring. She's gonna to have to cut, spray and daub or pull, dig and pull, dig and pull. So um, she's got it, some work on her hands, but I know she's up to it. Some native alter alternatives to large leaf privet. The um, cherry laurel might be more water hungry than what you really want. So watch that. Also don't plant that close to your house. The Southern wax myrtle, we talked about that earlier. And one we haven't talked about that's really good for our ecoregion is the evergreen sumac, the rice spirens. Here's a picture I took of a monarch a few summer, I'm sorry, a few falls ago. So this was a migratory, it was a big monarch. 
on its way to Mexico. And um, that was at the Heard Museum after I had taken the bird class for the native landscape certification course. Here's the Japanese ligustrum, another problem ligustrum, of course, uh, replaces native plants, shading them out, all these things. Go back to this list. Any of these would be a better choice. Right, and that makes Carol Abbott happy. I hope there's not a lag between slides. We, I had that on another talk one time. It's not as good as it could have been. Anyway, so these are some native alternatives that Didi had in her uh, talk, but I think that they are not as good for our ecoregion as the other plants. But if you have, you know, I have friends that have land in Kimball County near Junction, and by by golly, they might want to do the Barbados cherry or the Mexican silk tassel. Or I have friends that have property in East Texas and they might want to go with the cherry laurel. So know your ecoregions, know your rainfall, know what grows there and know the plants. I used to love seeing this. We had this, my neighbor, my, um, in the neighborhood I grew up in, there was one of these, I just loved it, but not anymore. Here's some alternatives, the Yopon, the evergreen sumac and the possum haw holly. And here's a problematic plant, the large leaf lantana or lantana camera. This is from um, the Caribbean and from Northern Venezuela. It's invasive in Texas and throughout the um, Southeast, or Southeastern United States. Unfortunately, Bonap shows it as being native. So that's a problem, it's not. So you have to be careful about your sources. Usually Bonap uh, is a very good source for what's invasive and not. Um, anyway, I went to South Africa a few years ago to visit a friend there, and the only word she could say about this plant was hate, and it killed sheep and cattle, and it um, can blind animals, and in South Africa, it can grow as big as an RV, and what a problem, and it was an escape from a botanical the story is from a botanical garden. I don't know why you would want to bring anything into South Africa. Their plants are way cool anyway. They have the coolest plants. So this is a problem and you could say, oh, how do I tell the difference? They, they, they all look so much alike. And yes, you are absolutely right. You have a link on one of your resources about this plant. Uh, you can't just tell from the color of flower in any way, unfortunately anymore, because it has hybridized with our native, Lantana camera. And this is mainly native to the Edwards Plateau and parts west. So not really native to the ecoregion we're in, but it will work here. The autumn sage isn't really native to our ecoregion anyway. But you know what? It's native to Texas. And every single butterfly and hummingbird will know what to do with Lantana. I'm sorry, will know what to do with Greg Salvia, and the butterflies know what to do with Lantana. Uh, the autumn sage, if we have a mild winter, can bloom all year round. Uh, the pictures on the right there are from my garden from three seasons. So um, Nandina needs to be, don't buy it, don't ask for it, tell your nurseries, don't grow it. Tell them you don't want it. Tell them it breaks your heart to see it there because this plant in the seeds there can have uh, cyanide. And so it can be damaging if eaten in quantity to animals, uh, mammals, and birds. Uh, it really hungry birds can come through and overeat them and have great problems and even die. So if you're just gonna keep your ugly Nandina around, be sure you cut off the berries, which might be the only reason we would have them. So I don't know, don't plant it. It's a bamboo and it says heavenly bamboo. Oh my gosh, the opposite of heavenly when we have so many other choices, right? The Argarita is, um, I think maybe to our Western cross chambers, uh, there's the dwarf Yopon, Autumn Sage again, Yopon Holly. So there's, there's alternatives. Japanese Honeysuckle is invasive. It can take over. Doesn't it smell delicious? Well, it does, but it's not good for us. Coral honeysuckle, how beautiful is that? We talked about it last week, plus the uh, clear wing moth. It is a uh, host plant for the clear wing moth. How cool is that? 
The Carolina Jasmine's a spring bloomer. Uh, you can see it can really grow up on things. So you want a strong trellis for that. Here's an invasive plant. I had, oh gosh, I hope I'm running out of time. I'm, I really need to go faster, but I can't help myself. Here's how you go to the native plant in uh, database. And then you can learn about all these things. This is the one that I had plus 200. So here's how you go. And you can also learn about other invasive things. So let's um, go back to the talk. Here's some alternatives. The Lindheimer muley is an Edwards Plateau in Park South. But the other recommendations here, Indian grass, switchgrass, silver blue stem, even little blue stem, these are grasses that are native to our region and uh, they have height and they're, they're bunch grasses, just like that is. Um, so I think you would be happy with these, especially that Indian grass, it's so pretty. Bamboo, oh, I, don't we all know about this now? It's a, really a bear to try to get rid of and it will grow. It's a grass, it's like, a giant, giant's grass, the opposite of Barbie's grass. It's a giant grass. Uh, the Lindheimer muley or big blue stem or Dee Dee's recommending the cherry laurel as a replacement because maybe people want it for a screen. If you want to do a screen, I suggest doing a polyculture. Don't just plant one plant. That's gosh, not a good idea ever. Plant a bunch of different kinds of plants that can, can make you a nice little screen there. An elephant ear, um, before I moved to the property we're at now, we've been here for 24, 25 years, I had a small suburban garden with a pool and I planted uh, not elephant ear, but yarrow around it. And I had to water and water and water and water and water. And when we moved here, that was one push to go join the Native Plant Society and learn about plants that I didn't have to water all the time to make them look halfway good. These will invade our riparian areas. They're very, very um, invasive especially as you get more into central Texas. Here are a couple alternatives. Um, let's see, one of them, let me look at my notes, is better for us in our area. So the, um, oh, I don't have those listed on here. It's something else listed. Oh, we'll have to look them up. Oh, I know the Delta, sorry, let me go back. The Delta airwood, it, uh, the leaves are narrow. I mean, it grows in water. The pickle weed grows in water. So maybe if you have a pond, you'll wanna choose those. Lizard's tail grows in water too, it's native. It's a cool plant. Here we go. Here's the common periwinkle, uh, blue periwinkle. They're, I mean, they're forming mats under that tree. Again, ooh, some alternatives that might a little bit more breathing space. The um, snake herb is a more of a water plant. Uh, of course, you know, that's what Lady Bird Johnson says. And you need to talk to people though, because they may say, I have that, I never water, it's fine. So maybe it's okay with the amount of natural rainfall that you might be getting in wherever you wanna put it. The purple ground cherry can take dry areas. And the frog fruit is a host plant for a lot of butterflies. And uh, Josephine, I'll know exactly which ones. I've seen frog fruit growing in the street. So it's a tough plant. What can we do? Well, now that you know about in places plants, you can't do this anymore, right? Oh yeah, nope, 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 nope. We can't do that. We're gonna have to speak up. We're gonna have to keep our eyes open. In, in the Native Plant Society, the uh, conservation of native plants and plant habitats is part of our mission. And there's the Lorax. If y'all haven't read the Lorax recently, it's a Dr. Seuss book. You may wanna go back because he spoke for the trees, but, and we do too, but we speak for the habitats as well. So the whole interconnected systems. Uh, and what does conservation mean? A careful preservation, a protection of something, something, a planned management of a natural resource to prevent exploitation, destruction. Okay, that's conservation. Some um, synonyms are preservation, protecting, protection, safeguarding, safekeeping, guarding, saving, looking after, guardianship, keeping alive, maintenance, repair, restoration. It's a big word and we have a lot of work. 
Here's something I want to alert you to that the our new executive director sent out from the Invasive Plant Committee and the executive board about a problem we're having in Brazos County there. That is uh, the Lorax here is speaking up for the Post Oak and Savannah ecoregion. The Aggies, God bless them, they're one of our premier agricultural institutions in Texas. They do a lot of good. But in this particular case, we're having a problem. They're planning on planting 109 Chinese elms in the Aggie Park, the new Aggie Park. And I think the Aggie Park is a wonderful idea. I think it's it's a great, great idea. But oh, but, oh my goodness, don't plant invasive plants there. Plant native Texas plants. The uh, US Forest Service um, has identified this as a invasive plant. And you can see that in all these highlighted states, it's a problem. The Lorax is not happy. They have aggressive root systems. They're going to be a problem in riparian areas. Here is a riparian area that our uh, Dwight uh, Bullmeyer from our Post Oak and Savannah um, Post Oak chapter in College Station has many more pictures just like this showing it along Wolfpin Creek um, in College Station. So we're hoping that they won't plant these Aggie Park things. Uh, maybe they'll, maybe they won't do it, but it's your donations if you donate and your te our tax dollars at work. So you can have a voice and write them and say, please don't do this. Please plant other native plants instead. Remember we talked about uh, Monorta fistulosa. The reason they're planting these plants is because they're burgundy in the fall. Well, oh my gosh, Monarda fistulosa is gorgeous burgundy color. It's a forb, it's not a big tree, but hey, it might work. So what can you do? Write Native Plant Society, natural resources around you, find out what's invasive in your area and, and don't plant them and dig them out of your yard or your acreage. Learn to identify them, remove them, and then let's just use non-invasive plants in our property, which pretty much means native. And you wanna become part of the solution. That's why y'all are here. We know we can learn vicariously. You're smart people, that's what smart people do. And Doug Talame, if, you, if you've never uh, gone to YouTube and written his name in and watched any of his videos, I recommend you do. He also has many books out. This is his idea. The, one of the main things that's causing species um, extinction is urbanization and habitat destruction. So if we take all of our yards together and we plant native plants, we can make this ginormous homegrown national park that would be in total uh, combined bigger than any of our national parks combined. It, it, this is the um, screenshot from his website, the homegrown national park. So you can go there and get started. And he's a very positive, wonderful person. He has a lot of great stories. Um, it's regenerate, regenerative uh, biodiversity. We want to regenerate biodiversity. Excuse me. So we just don't want pretty gardens anymore with uh, some exotic plants or non-native plants or na uh, invasives. And not every non-native plant is invasive. They're, my irises are fine. They just are, I'd have to thin them. So, but, well, now we want our plants to do double duty. We want them to help us with climate change. We want to help us with the insect de decline. And we want to help them manage water because we're over urbanizing everything. So we're putting in rain gardens. We want to, we can do these things with our gardens. So plant native. So you can go to his site. You can get on the map. No experience necessary, just knowledge. I got on the map last night. I know how many and how many um, zip codes were in last night when I went and registered my property. Now, I hope that you all will register all those demo gardens and all your Monarch Way stations and all those things you have in Tarrant County to show that we support the homegrown national park. You can, you, of course, you're, you're self-educating, you're here. I absolutely don't expect you to read any of this. I'm just showing you the different handouts that you have and get them on your computer and there'll be active links. This is one link to, oh, I'm running out of time, I have to hurry, uh, from the city of um, Austin. It's wonderful, you see how they've done their 
their table of contents, common name, and um, scientific name, genus species. Here's a Chinese pistache. Oh my goodness. This is one that just drives me nuts. Look, you can buy them. Boy, you can buy one for $130. And then when the female, if you've got a female plant and it starts making berries and your neighbors start getting them in the yard, then your neighbors can drive by your house and go, because that's what I do, the ones that are near me. Anyway, buy native plants. As for native plants, go to a Native Plant Society chapter sale. We'll be having lots of sales coming up. March, April, May, June here in North Texas. And you can get plants that do not have any poisons in them, no neonicotinoids, which is a whole other story about a poison that is legal in the United States and illegal in Europe. Read the labels. If you're at the nursery and they go, well, that's a Texas chase tree. And you go on your computer that could take you to the moon if you wanted to go now and say, no, it's not, look. So you can teach people at the nursery. And we also have a list of nice nurseries on our website. And Rooted In will be added soon, as will um, John Snowden's and Randy Johnson's um, the nursery soon. So we're adding two more for this area. There, uh, This is one of the programs the Native Plant Society has. You can join our society and get around like-minded friends. You could take classes, NLCP classes. Uh, first one's required. The other ones you can take in any order. If you're a uh, professional in the nursery trade, uh, more than likely your business will let you qualify that for continuing educational units. We are having a spring symposium, which is, uh, gosh, look how great that is. The West Cape Reserve, that's a great story. It's beautiful, Ray and I went there in November. We had just got boosted. I had a great antibody count, it was one, wore a mask, but we looked at this beautiful place, it was wonderful. Um, we'll have another invasive plant talk. I can't wait to hear that. There's always something to learn. Well, let's talk about orchids. Adam Black is a wonderful speaker and excellent photographer. George Diggs, many of y'all know him. He's a great speaker. Uh, we get to talk about Lady Bird Johnson, take a tour there and hear about the fauna project. So that's for members. I think it's $20. So bargain. And thank you. Whew. I think I came in in 55 minutes. Um, I don't know, I'll stop sharing now and we can see if there's any questions. Thank y'all so much for coming. Thank Are there any you. Oh, my <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so do we have any questions? We've gotten a lot um, in the chat about um, nurseries um, and even a few, store, a few horror stories about nurseries who sold um, plants thinking they were one thing and they turned out to be invasive. Mm -hmm. You did, um, Kristen just said, uh, so many plants mimic each other, which is the best book or app to make sure that you know which plants you're looking at, which is a great oh, That's a great question. Uh, I like the Sally Wasowski book that we looked at last week. Uh, it's an oldie but a goodie. We, Michael Eason's book, uh, Rand, Ricky Lennox's book. Those are three really good books and they're on that resource page the, from the first day. Awesome. Um, you uh, actually answered the question I was going to ask, which is how does one know the right um, nursery to go to? Um, if you're like me and brand new to it and looking at a, um, a house that already has some landscaping in it. How do I go about fixing it? Who do I talk to? But you told us about the nice nurseries. Mm -hmm. so that's gonna be a serious help to me. <laughs> Good. Good. All right. And that's a, there's a, it's a, on our website. You can go there and see the list of nice nurseries around the state. And of course, we, uh, those, that's a chapter based program where the chapters work with nurseries. So sometimes you can get discounts uh, I know a few of our area ones give to North Central chapters a 10% discount. So, hey. Awesome. That's amazing. Card. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So do we have any other questions um, in the chat or here in the room? Oh, Sherry, thank you for, for liking the program. I, I worked really hard on it. <laughs> no, this has been I, wonderful. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. I, I'm really happy. Uh, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
um, looking for the doc you've referenced. So it's, I sent it um, at the beginning of the, around 1039. I sent the documents so they would be at the beginning of the chat if you go and look. Um, if you weren't here at the time, I will actually be resending those on Tuesday to everybody whose email address I've got, um, including the folks in the room who's given me their email address on the sign up sheet. So all of those links um, here in the room, all of those links, you don't have to type them in yourself. I will send you the documents. Um, so I want to thank everybody for coming this and thank you, Kim, for for joining us. This was wonderful. Um, oh, my just the, uh, the tiniest bit of housekeeping um, tomorrow, you should be getting an email um, with a survey link to it. Um, if you liked this program, those don't come from nowhere. We need to know what you want to see, who you want to see. So if you tell us you loved Kim, we will get her back. Oh. Um, anticipate you love okay I, you need to get josephine to come talk about butterflies the butterfly Amazing. garden awesome no perfect um that's exactly the kind of information we love to have and that's why we'd like you to fill out our surveys um my friends here in the room just drop the survey on me um and all of you in the zoom fill out the survey because we love to hear from you um we have more gardening programs happening all through the spring and summer um check out our website, um, ask your local librarian. Uh, we've got stuff going on all through, as I said, spring, summer and into fall. Um, so we're not going anywhere. The gardens aren't going anywhere. Um, and we want to want to see you guys back. Oh, and you've got to go see that garden at the Southwest um, Regional. Oh, it's just stunning. It's a beautiful garden. There are benches you can sit and look at your newly checked out book and enjoy <laughs> it. Oh, it's just so nice. Yes. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you all. Um, I hope we see you all next time. And thank you so much, Kim, for everything. Is there anything else from anybody? Any more questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, one more. So we have a um, we have a program coming up in the fall, in the early fall about planting butterfly gardens. We don't have a bird one just yet, but hey, if you want a bird one, we will get you a bird one. We will put it away. <laughs> You're very welcome. So the Audubon the Society is pretty strong here. Um, we, some of the Native Plant Society people are in, in the Audubon Society. So I'm drawing a blank. Roseanne, what's Roseanne's last name? Goodness, uh, forgot. That's okay. No, <laughs> we will figure that out. And we will, okay. if that's what's wanted, that is what we will get you guys. All right. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank you again, Kim. And I hope you all have a fabulous day and we will see you the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.